Welcome everyone, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat on working successfully with interpreters and translators. Hola, bienvenidos todos a la plática con un café de core de hoy sobre cómo trabajar exitosamente con intérpretes y traductores. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young, and we are your hosts today. Yo soy Nicole Lezen, una de las consultoras locales que facilita una iniciativa en todo el condado llamada Las Inversiones del Colectivo de Resultados Basados en la Evidencia o CORE, junto con Nicole Young. Nosotras somos sus anfitrionas hoy. And in relation to today's topic, our core institute events like this one are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Lauerman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. Y en relación con el tema de hoy, nuestros eventos del Instituto de CORE se llevan a cabo de forma bilingüe con interpretación al español. Esto es gracias a los miembros de nuestro equipo, Stella Larman, quien brinda interpretación simultánea y traduce todos nuestros materiales de CORE, y Gisela Carrasco, que está brindando interpretación consecutiva en este momento y quien traducirá los comentarios y preguntas en el chat. So before we get started, we wanted to take a moment to cover a few important details about how to participate today. Y antes de comenzar, queríamos tomar un momento para cubrir algunos detalles importantes de cómo participar hoy. We're providing simultaneous interpretation, so you'll need to select your language channel by clicking or tapping the globe icon and selecting English or Spanish. You'll need to pick one or the other. Estamos brindando interpretación simultánea, por lo que usted deberá seleccionar el canal de idioma en que desea participar haciendo clic o tocando el icono del mundo o globo terráqueo y seleccionando inglés o español. Debe elegir uno o el otro. And we suggest that you do not select mute original audio. Leave it unchecked, no matter which language channel you're on. That means you may hear someone speaking in another language before you hear the interpreter, but it also means you won't have problems with hearing people speak when they're on the same channel as you are. Le sugerimos que no seleccione audio original, déjelo sin marcar, sin importar el canal de idioma en el que usted se encuentre. Esto significa que puede escuchar a alguien hablando en otro idioma antes de que escuche al intérprete, pero también significa que no tendrá problemas para escuchar a las personas hablar cuando están en el mismo canal de usted. So, is everyone on a language channel at this point? If you need any help, if this doesn't make sense to you, just send a chat to me, Nicole Lezen. Gisela will repeat what I just said in Spanish, and then we'll switch to just simultaneous interpretation from this point forward. Esperamos que todos estén en su canal de idioma preferido. Si usted eh, necesita ayuda, puede enviar un chat a Nicole Lezen, y a partir de este momento cambiaremos a la interpretación simultánea. So a few other things about Zoom. So Feel free from this point forward to speak in either English or Spanish when you're asking a question. Stella can interpret both ways. Just start by saying, I have a question or tengo una pregunta so that Stella can interpret on the right language channel. And we'll move on to some overviews of CORE itself. And for that, I'll turn it over to Nicole Young. Thanks, Nicole. So CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. Uh, and many people know it as a funding model. That's how it began, as a way to provide funding to community-based organizations. And over the last several years, it really has evolved into what we call a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And on the next slide, you'll see the mission and vision statement that we created with many um, partners, collaborators through events like this, uh, where we gathered input and, and the theme of equity really stood out. And so we've always kept it front and center uh, as we think about and define what CORE is. 
And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan will have equitable opportunities to experience these eight inter interdependent <laughs> and interconnected core conditions for health and well-being, meaning that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other social and cultural identities. And so as both a funding model and a movement, CORE really provides us some common language and a framework to align our priorities and programs and policies and funding and results around community-wide goals and then work together to create the core conditions for health and well-being. So we want you to notice how the, there are dotted lines connecting all of them. So we really see our, our collective work together as connecting those dots between the core conditions and keeping equity at the center of the diagram as a way to remind us that we have to continuously examine and address our individual, our organizational and our systemic beliefs and practices and structures, because those are often the very things that perpetuate the inequities we're trying to eliminate. And events like the CORE Coffee Chat today are offered under what we call the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments, where we focus on building shared language and tools and skills in order to fulfill the CORE mission and vision. Okay, on the next slide, you'll see that one of the commitments that we've made, uh, we made like over a year ago now, um, was that we wanted to make information from the CORE Institute events as accessible as possible in multiple languages to both service providers who are our usual audience and other individuals, families, people who might speak uh, particularly Spanish throughout the community. And so we made that decision, we've made that commitment for many reasons, including wanting to be inclusive and follow best practices of language justice, which calls for respecting every person's ability to communicate and understand and be understood in the language they prefer and in which they feel most articulate and powerful. So we're still learning how to do this well, and, and we <laughs> often still make mistakes, uh, but we've developed new skills and habits, thanks in part to the partnerships we have with highly skilled interpreters and translators and other bilingual partners, uh, like the ones we have on our on our call today. So in addition to our regular core team members, Della Lauerman and Gisela Carrasco, who again provide our main language support for core events, today we're really happy to welcome Beatriz Trujillo Ortiz and Jorge Valenzuela, who are both experienced interpreters um, and have also supported our core events from time to time. So they will each introduce themselves in a few moments and then share some tips and insights that they worked with Stella to compile and Gisela. Um, and these tips represent things that you can do to prepare interpreters and translators that you work with to be able to do their job successfully so that your multilingual audiences have a positive, meaningful, and equitable experience. Okay, but before we get to the good stuff, we do want to um, do a short poll here just to get a sense of how much experience we have here in our virtual room working with interpreters and translators. So do you, are you here and, and you're feeling, ah, I really don't have any of that experience at all working with interpreters and translators in meetings and events? Have you attended bilingual meetings, but you haven't facilitated one before? Um, does your agency work with interpreters and translators very often, so you have a lot of experience? Or, and or, are you someone who provides interpretation and translation in meetings and events? So I'll give everybody a moment to fill this out, and then we'll look at the results. I see about half of you have participated. If you're still thinking or trying to figure out how to answer the poll, I'll give it another five seconds before I end it. Four, three, two, one. Okay. So let's see what we have here. We have a couple of you saying not, no experience at all. Several of you, uh, a lot of you have attended bilingual meetings but haven't facilitated one yet. And about an even number of you have, are saying that your agency works with interpreters often so you have experience or you provide interpretation and or translation in meetings and events. So great, we have a nice 
array of experience. And so we'll encourage you um, after we hear all the tips from Beatriz and Jorge, feel free to um, add your own tips, ask other questions, share things in the chat. Um, and I see Beth, your comment in the chat about none of the answers fit for you. So <laughs> uh, that is sometimes the challenge with closed and ended questions and polls. So see that your agency has worked with interpreters, but only a few times. So still consider yourself new to it. I'm guessing there are probably others that feel the same way or, or in a similar position. Okay, and again, before we turn over to Beatriz and Jorge, I wanna go to the next slide and review a, a couple definitions uh, with, with everyone. And so this is something that we had to learn early on. The terms interpretation and translation are often used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. So that's one thing we learned again early on from Stella. Uh, and so we thought it would be helpful to review some of these definitions and a description of what each uh, involves in terms of skills. So when we use the phrase simultaneous interpretation, that means the interpreter listens to one language and then they're speaking in another language in real time. So you can imagine that requires specialized training and skill to be able to keep pace with the speaker. Uh, and so when interpreters begin their training, they start just by simply repeating what the speaker says in English to become accustomed to keeping pace with the speaker. So imagine like listening, <laughs> waiting for a second, then repeating while you're still listening. Um, so that skill of staying just a second behind the speaker without falling behind is called décalage. And I hope I'm saying that right. It's a French word that means gap or time lag. And so it takes years of practice and training to become really adept at simultaneous interpretation. Uh, and in our area, we have a lot of people who are bilingual and fluent in English and Spanish or other languages. Uh, but they may not necessarily have the specialized training that's that's required to interpret simultaneously with the speed and accuracy that's required. A different type of skill is um, consecutive interpretation. So that's when a person speaks in their native language and the interpreter converts what was said to another language. Uh, and that's, that happens after the per person has finished speaking. So it means there are pauses or breaks between sentences when each person is speaking. So that requires the interpreter to have very strong short-term memory skills to be able to retain what the person has said and convey it word for word in the other language without paraphrasing and inadvertently changing the meaning. So this method is typically used in court hearings or depositions or when interpreting equipment is not available in a live in-person meeting. Or like we did today, uh, we do this at the beginning of virtual meetings when we know that people might be joining at different times, so we want to make sure everyone's hearing the instructions when they when they first join uh, in their preferred language. On the next slide, you'll see another type of interpreting that is called sight translation. So the interpreter here is reading a document in one language and then orally interpreting the content in another language. So it requires the same ability as simultaneous interpretation to like read and process and simul you know interpret all at the same time. Um, but instead of conveying what a, another person is saying, it's interpreting the content from a written document. And then finally, we have written translation, which is only about written documents. So some people do both interpretation and translation. Um, some people prefer to only do written translation because it's uh, slightly less stressful, <laughs> but still requires really strong, you know, grammatical skills to be able to understand what the original content is, is meant to say, and then being able to find the culturally appropriate equivalents because there are many phrases or idioms or sayings in different languages that don't really translate word for word into another language. So the translator has to know like, okay, what does this mean in this language? What, what's the best way to say it in, the, in another language. Um, this also often requires extensive research if the document has really specialized terminology, a lot of either technical language or jargon or very industry specific language. Okay, so those are our definitions we wanted to review before we go much farther. And now we will turn it over to hear from our experts in the field that are joining us today, Beatriz and Jorge. Uh, Nicole, if you want to go to the next slide. Again, they're going to take a moment to, to introduce themselves briefly, and then they'll take turns sharing some helpful tips to work successfully with interpreters and translators. 
And I'll just say, as you see and hear these tips, uh, we encourage you to make a mental note or written note about which of these things you already do and which of these things you want to start doing or do more consistently. Uh, because after they've reviewed all the tips, we'll invite questions and invite you to share your insights. And we'll also do a little poll again to see which of these tips are you currently using and doing. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking now and uh, turn it over. Beatrice, do you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Thank you, Nicole. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for making the time and for having us here. I see some familiar names of uh, people that I have worked with, so I'm excited to see those names in the chat, and thank you for making this time. I know we all have busy schedules, but let's let's go talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and like Nicole mentioned previously, this is in an effort to make each other each other's work um, be easier and be the best that it can be when we are very coordinated between the agencies, translators, and interpreters. I think we just are able to convey the work in a very different way that it's more meaningful for the agency itself and for the people that are receiving the language services. So thank you for having us here and I'll pass it over to Jorge. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I am Jorge Valenzuela. Uh, I've been doing interpretation for I think about, I don't know, 12 years or so. Uh, whether it's um, as a volunteer or whether it's through, um, you know, professional services. But it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope that you take a lot from this and that, you know, you discover that it's not as um, hard to access and that it can really bring people together. Yeah, thank you, Jorge. So I'm going to take it back to talk about tip number one. Jorge and I will be taking turns so that you can hear different voices and you don't get just sewn out by just listening to my voice or Jorge's voice. <clears throat> so let's go and talk about tip number one, which is uh, at the very beginning of when we know we're going to need bilingual um, services. When you're designing your event, thinking that this is a, an event for a, multiling for a multilingual audience. So what does that mean? That means thinking about who is going to listen to you the information that you are presented or who's going to see your visuals if you're doing it, whether it is in a virtual space or a, a physical space. So how do you communicate that the space is inclusive? If people, if this is an in-person meeting and everything that is um, set up is in, only in English, maybe people feel like it's not as inclusive because while they are mingling around all the information that it's posted around the room is in English. Same thing when uh, they join a virtual meeting. If everything, if the instructions to join the Zoom interpretation are only in English, or if we don't have that well, people are waiting around, like what's the perception of the space for people that are joining this meeting or that are joining this workshop? One of the things that um, it's good to think about is what will th this be my experience if I was only a monolingual Spanish speaker? Like, will I feel as welcome if? If I'm only, um, will it be the same welcoming for a monolingual English speaker than a monolingual Spanish speaker? Just thinking about those things. Sometimes if you have a bilingual staff, it helps to ask him like, hey, does this make sense if somebody that only speaks Spanish comes into this meeting? Like, will this make sense for them? So maybe just running it by colleagues as well. Another thing to be mindful of is when you are in a space where people are gonna present information, Will people that don't speak English as their primary language will feel like they can also ask a question in lifetime? Will it make more sense to have some speakers that present primarily in Spanish and some speakers that present primarily in English so that people feel as um, that they can ask their questions in real time as much as possible? Doing these things where some presenters speak English, some presenters speak Spanish. It might take coordination with your interpreter, but it's worth building a relationship with those interpreters that are closer to home, that your agency starts working with, so that when you're having to do this coordination, it becomes easier and easier for both your interpreter and also your agency and your staff. And with that, Jorge, do you have anything else to add to tip number one? Um, no, I think it's, you know, it's just, it's, it is very important. Uh, I, I've been to meetings where sometimes the monolingual English speakers feel that they don't have to wear the headsets. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's just important to remind everybody that if you're a monolingual uh, speaker, you should wear the headsets because some folks are going to be speaking 
in Spanish and you're going to be translating that into English and, and vice versa. So, um, you know, it's always important to make people feel inclusive by asking everyone who, who's not bilingual to, to wear the devices. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I've had questions where Spanish speakers sometimes provide a lot of perspective to what's being talked about. But because the English speakers didn't have a headset or because mm -hmm. they think that they understand most of it, they didn't get the full picture of the perspective that that person was bringing into the meeting. Right. Or you have to stop the meeting to translate into English and it doesn't flow mm -hmm. as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you want to go on with tip number two? Yeah. Um, so with tip number two, I think... Um, it's to send the materials to the interpreter uh, a few days in advance uh, for review. Um, and it's so key and important, especially when it's a new interpreter. Um, you know, I've been in situations where I'm asked to join a board meeting. It could be a board meeting for, for a hospital or a nonprofit organization. So while the participants in the meeting, they might be familiar with the technical terms, both the English speakers, the monolingual English speakers and the monolingual Spanish speakers, as an interpreter, you're sometimes getting there for the first time and you might not uh, necessarily be familiar with the work that is being done or with the background um, or everything that it, that, that it entails. So being able to translate uh, from English to Spanish so that the meeting flows uh, is very important. Uh, sometimes presentations are made uh, where the people who are listening to the presentation are listening to it for the first time. So the folks who are presenting the information, they're... Um, you know, they, they recognize that. So they present it in a way that the listeners are going to understand. But there are other situations where you might join a working board meeting where big decisions are going to be made and you want to make sure that you are translating correctly and that the folks who are there are understanding, um, uh, you know, what's being translated. So if they're used to hearing a particular term in a certain way, that you understand that um, so that they can, you know, that the, that the meeting can flow. Um, so that's, that's part of that. And then if you are going to be translating documents, it's important to have that material at least a week in advance so you can do it um, properly, right? You can do the research. Um, sometimes there's words that are very technical, like I said, in nonprofit sectors or in hospital sectors where you want to make sure that that um, you can ask questions back. You can maybe send it for an initial review to the person and say, does this look, uh, does this look okay? And maybe get it back. And then you can have a final presentation. Uh, it's also important to have documents that you can actually edit, right? So if you get PDF documents, you don't want the, uh, person who's going to be translating those documents so they have to rewrite the entire document into a Word document and then put it into a, a PDF document. So you want it to be presented in an edible version that they can easily, um, you know, retype um, alongside um, the original document. So that's, uh, you know, that's super important. Um, and like I said, you know, I, um, just being in, especially like in working meetings where you're just there and it's, you know, it's heavy work, heavy decisions are being made. It's especially important that, um, especially if the translator has been there for the first time, uh, that they understand and they're able to make the meeting flow. Sometimes when you have an interpreter who's been in those same meetings for a long time, they already understand it. You know, they've gotten it after the first uh, few meetings and it's not a big deal. But if it's, it's, it's going to be a new interpreter coming into a meeting, uh, that's especially important. I don't know if, uh, if you've had the same uh, situation, Beatriz. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also it ties a little bit uh, when uh, when translating documents. It ties a little bit to the previous tip of being mindful of your audience. If this is a document that you will want to be translated or a presentation that you want to be bilingual as you're drafting it, just keeping in mind the space that you're going to need for both languages. If it's a document that 
I've seen like a school districts that they want to do one side of the page in English, the back of the page in Spanish. It doesn't always fit that perfectly. If the English yeah. page is too full of text, chances are the Spanish one is going to run into a two page. Um, so just being mindful of those things uh, because it will make everyone's life a little easier if we just think about this logistics ahead of time. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think you are next with tip number three. Yes, um, I said school districts and automatically the next one is acronyms. <laughs> I did a lot of interpretation for school districts and the, I mean, I think anything, um, wor any work with the state or that has the state funding requires a lot of acronyms, but explaining acronyms is very important. Sometimes, uh, depending on your field, you might already have some acronyms that you throw at meetings and at conversations really fast and that become part of your vocabulary because this is the world that you navigate on a day-to-day -day basis and everybody around you probably knows the acronym better than they do the full description of the acronym. Um, but when talking to the public, it's important to spell out those acronyms, especially because the interpreter might not be familiar with what that is. Um, it can become really challenging to understand the context of a conversation if you're basing it off of an acronym that you really don't have context for. Um, so one thing that can be useful if you have some uh, very repetitive acronyms that you use in your field, it can be having a glossary so that you already have that handy. And that if you're using some of this, um, acronyms in a workshop because it's necessary because you want to educate the public about certain things that requires the use of those acronyms or to be familiar with those acronyms, just having a standard translation for them so that can people that people can relate it right away in the other language. It's very useful. Like it's, it's a tool that I highly recommend. And the other thing with acronyms is also the jargon. Sometimes it's really easy to get caught up on the jargon that you have already learned, the one that you have to put into reports and into documents every day, but not everyone is as familiar with that topic. So when when you don't have to use jargon, it's just being mindful that you don't have to use it all the time. And depending on the, on the public that you're trying to engage, getting too technical might have an impact on people's capacity to understand what you're saying. But I also know that sometimes the whole point of having some of these meetings, some of these workshops, is that people understand a little bit more of the technical knowledge that you have, that you want to provide the technical knowledge to someone. And that's that's great. It's just going back to the last point that Jorge was saying, sending that information ahead to the interpreters so that they are familiar with the dragon and that when you are presenting your expertise, that we are able to relate as much of the message as possible with the right uh, vocabulary for it. And again, if that's if it's very technical, always consider the option of having a glossary of terms so that you can just have it ready at your meetings, whether it is at a virtual space or at an in-person space. Do you have anything else that you that you want to add to this one, Jorge? Uh, no, just just acronyms. It's, it's just super important. And acronyms, I mean, they don't translate. So if you are trying to translate. Um, Letter by letter, it won't work. One of the things that I've seen in one of the meetings is that right before the meeting, they actually pasted a paper on the wall and they said, okay, give us all the acronyms we're going to use for this meeting. They were <laughs> all the acronyms they can think of of every organization and they spelled it out, right? So it was always on the wall, the whole meeting. And uh, it was pretty easy for me to, to reference and for other people too, because sometimes even the English speakers you know, sometimes you're speaking to yourself in, in, in your own language, but sometimes you might not know what a specific acronym is. So you could just see people looking up at the at the wall to make sure they knew what the acronym was. Yeah, and I almost forgot uh, Stella that is doing our live interpretation. She also pointed out sometimes there are uh, acronyms that they don't really have a a translation in Spanish. So when you throw out an acronym, we have to spell out the whole thing mm -hmm. or short, shorter phrases. Like in English, we say nonprofits very often, like every nonprofit, nonprofit, nonprofit. That's only one compound word. In Spanish, it will take five words to just convey the, mini, the meaning. So using yeah. a lot of those can get really challenging uh, for the interpreter when they're trying to keep, to, when they're trying to do the live interpretation. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. So with that, I'll pass it back to you for, for tip number four, Jorge. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, especially it's, uh, it's important if you have, uh, if your agency has a preferred uh, name for itself in English or Spanish that the translator know. So uh, I'll give you this situation. So imagine you're doing a press conference and you're translating. And uh, one example that I can think of is the United Farm Workers, right? So UFW, uh, United Farm Workers, uh, a senior interpreter translate La Unión de Trabajadores Agrícolas. But that's not what the organization calls itself. In Spanish, the UFW, the United Farm Workers, is La Unión de Campesinos. So if the interpreter is translating the name of the organization wrong to a, in a live event where it might get media coverage and he's saying the name of your organization wrong to the people that you're trying to reach, um, you're kind of defeating the purpose of the, of the, of the press conference, right? Uh, so that's why it's super important that if you have a preferred name uh, that, you, uh, that you let the interpreter or the translator uh, no. Uh, same thing goes uh, if you need specific uh, translations for certain things. For example, the land acknowledgement. Um, that's something that's read super fast because it's written down. So the person doing the presentation, they'll read the land acknowledgement. Um, but if you are hearing the land acknowledgement for the first time, you're going to translate it or you're going to interpret it differently from what other interpreters might have um, done in the past. So it's important that that might, that that be uh, written out and that all we, that people know um, how to, how to interpret them. The same thing for names of programs. If you have specific programs that you're trying to um, market to the community, specific um, organizations, specific workshops, specific classes, and you have you already have a name for themselves that you're trying to you know make sure that name gets out there to the community. Make sure that the translator knows that that's the name you want to use for the for those programs because interpretation um, depends who is translating. They might interpret it differently, right? So I think uh, one of the running jokes is everything you say is subject to interpretation, right? So I might interpret something differently from the way Beatriz interprets it. Uh, so it's very important if you have specific names that the, that the interpreter knows so that they can put those out. Um, another example too that we were speaking about is, uh, for example, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. If you're hearing that for the first time as an interpreter, you're saying Adverse Childhood Experiences and people are saying ACEs, 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 you might not know what that means. So you have to make sure that the interpreter knows what it means. So it's experiencias adversas de la niñez, which is E-A-N, but if you say E-A-N to a Spanish speaker, they're not gonna know what that is. Uh, so it's very important that that, that gets spelled out. Um, and I think that ties in, well, it doesn't really tie in, but my, the next tip is, or I don't know if you want to say anything else, Beatriz, about that. No, I think that was perfect. And then uh, another tip, which is, a uh, pretty simple one is provide the presenters and the panel, the panelists' names and titles ahead of time, so that folks know who's speaking. Um, and it's important, I think, to ask everyone um, to put their names, on. Um, especially if you're doing a if you're doing a Zoom translation. Uh, explain to them how to rename yourselves. Uh, you know, through the through the um, through the Zoom app, uh, asking them to name themselves and what organization they're part of, or what school their kids go to, or whatnot, so that you know they feel important, and then so that the everybody who's listening to them, they know, um, you know, they know where they're coming from, and especially if it's somebody, if especially if it's like the panelists, or if, uh, who are presenting that the people who are there to listen to them, they know who, who they are. Mm -hmm. Beatriz, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. You know what? I was looking at the chat and I see a comment from Onis Banuelos that their clinic's name is in Spanish, uh, but 
uh, but they don't think that it gets interpreted in the media. So, and I think this goes back to the previous tip. Some organizations, like Jorge was explaining, they have a preferred name in English and a preferred name in a different language, most more often in our area in Spanish. So when your organization has that already uh, identified and they have the name that they like to go by in English, the, the name that they like to go by in Spanish, that's when it's important to let the interpreter know. It doesn't mean that every organization needs to have a name, a name in English and a name in Spanish. It's only if you have a preferred translation for your agency's name, just um, disclose that to your interpreter so that they're referring to your agency with the term that you that you like to use or the name that you are established with. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But not every not every agency will have that. But it, it was more like in the event that your agency does, just bring mm -hmm. that forward to your interpreter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like United Farm Workers, that's one of the that's mm -hmm. one of the organizations that have two very different names. Or I mean, they're the same name, but they they can be interpreted differently. Mm -hmm. But they have one that they have used, and that that's mm -hmm. the one that they like to be identified right. with. And so we need to re we need to just as much as we can use that for consistency. That's right. So I'll move us along to tip number six, uh, which is having a practice session. It's really important, especially I know this sounds like additional time. But this is an, an effort to make the event flow a lot smoother for everyone, for the staff and your agency, but also for the interpreter. So it can be, if it's in a virtual space, having the practice session in the virtual platform that you're using, if that's Teams on Teams, if that's uh, Zoom on Zoom, just making sure that everything works fine and that people are able to access all of the features that we're gonna need the day of the event. I've been at a couple of meetings where sometimes, because Zoom, it's a little bit more tricky than we like to accept when we are setting up for interpretation. So there's a couple of things that have to happen from the very beginning of when you set up the, the meeting to have interpretation enabled. Not everybody knows that. And I've been at meetings where we don't have a practice session. And then when we arrive to the meeting, the Zoom link that was provided to the participants did not have interpretation enabled. Yeah. And at that point, we need to exit the meeting yeah. and then have to come back in. And it can be really confusing for people. So having a practice session can help us take care of all those little details, um, especially if it's in a virtual space, use the platform that you will be using uh, the day of the event. If it's at a physical location, uh, it can be a Zoom call, it can be a phone call, but just making sure that we are touching bases, that we know our roles, that we have all the, the equipment that we need. Um, and also to get familiar with each other, that you get to know your interpreter better, that your inter interpreter gets to know your organization a little bit better. Um, so that the day of the event or the meeting, we are as prepared as we can. Do you have anything to add to that one, Jorge? Um, no, I think you said it perfectly. Um, just the one thing that I can really think of is, um, you know, how many times has it happened to everyone where they're trying to open their computers or, or their Zoom app for the very first time in a long time and it, it's updating? <laughs> yes. And it starts updating, you're like, oh my God, the meeting's gonna start right now. So yeah, I think that's super, that's super important. Yeah, allowing to extra time or that you open up your computer and it needs an update or else yeah. it will not let you open the app. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, whether it is in person or it is in a virtual space, I think it's it's good to get there with 20, 30 minutes of buffer so that you're able to troubleshoot anything that might come up your way. Yeah, and even like in live, in live interpretations, uh, I guess it's more for the interpreter, but just making sure the equipment works, you have batteries, uh, or if it's the organization who's gonna be providing the, the equipment to the interpreter, make sure the bat it has enough batteries, or if it's, a, if it's one of the ones that gets charged, make sure they're charged. If you're gonna have to use multiple uh, translation devices, make sure they don't interfere with each other. Um, all of that's, you know, it's kind of um, the su super important to have this practice session. 
Yeah. When, when possible. I mean, it's not always possible. Yeah. Um, so I think minus number seven. Uh, so this is uh, super important. It kind of ties into what I was saying in the last one with uh, especially live events. Um, and it's very easy, right? When somebody hasn't been in a, an interpretation setting, it's very easy to just start sending questions to the interpreter uh, over chat, over the chat function, or to think, why isn't an interpreter translating the chat? Um, but it's, it's very difficult. I mean, if not impossible, if you are translating, you're interpreting simultaneously, there's multiple people speaking, and at the same time to be able to be translating over uh, the chat box. So, but I mean, having said that, uh, people love using the chat box and they have questions and then maybe they don't want to interrupt. So it's important to have a designated person to do that, to be able to be looking at the chat box and be maybe answering questions or be interpreting to make sure everybody understands. Uh, so having a designated person do that, um, it's, it's key and it's super important. Um, the same thing in live translation. So when you're out there um, in person and you are uh, interpreting and you have your headset on and people are listening to you interpret, last thing you want is, you know, people coming up to you and ask and telling you this device doesn't work, this device needs batteries. Um, because, I mean, you, you might be able to do it, but it, it, it's kind of tricky to figure out uh, which device is working and which one isn't and if it needs batteries or if it just doesn't work um, or, you know, having to do a sign-up sheet. Just figuring out all those, all those technical issues, um, uh, it's, it's important that the, you know, interpreter, whenever possible, be designated just for the interpreting. Um, I think that's super key. and. Um, what else were we talking about? And Gisela, I, I don't know if you wanted to say something because I know you were interpreting at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I think like you mentioned, well, obviously having this designated person, but letting the participants know the name of the team member, who they can go to. That way, like you said, the interpreter won't be receiving any messages that might then distract them or like you said they might even just go unnoticed because the interpreter is just too focused to even be checking their messages and then this person won't be getting the help they need and then um something that comes useful to me when doing this although my job is not nearly as difficult as Stella's who is interpreting simultaneously um I like to have a cheat sheet with instructions and chat mes messages that I most commonly use in every meeting and then I can just copy and paste from them uh, before the events and then just customize them, maybe change the names or add links, and this saves me some time. And then I make sure that one of these messages is a bilingual welcome message with the Zoom instructions and meeting details that I send to participants who join after the introduction, once we've covered the instructions, because they can't see the instructions that are posted on the chat before they join. So this lets them know how they can participate. And then we've learned that uh, assigning me as a co-host and then designating me to admit late participants also allows me to keep track of them and their names, because if somebody else is doing it, they might get to it too fast and then I won't know who joined late or maybe somebody just disconnected and joined back in. So they don't really need to know the instructions. So this just may, may causes less confusion and less of a hassle. And then of course, there's always a chance of tech and connection issues happening. So trying to include all these messages and links in a shared agenda lets other team members easily find them in case I get disconnected. And I think finally, just having two screens is definitely a lifesaver whenever you're having to look at different documents and also take, making sure you're looking at the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for the those insights. And I think uh, that's about it, unless you want to mention something else, Beatriz, or... Yeah. No, just thank you to Gisela. She makes life a lot easier <laughs> taking yeah. care of that task, <laughs> uh, making sure that people in the chat that are arriving a little bit later, they also get those bilingual instructions. It makes people everyone's life easier. So thank you, Gisela. But I'll move us along to tip number eight. 
which is making sure that the presenters or facilitators, like whoever is having a speaking role at your meetings, making sure that their mics work. Uh, this works in virtual spaces. It also works in uh, in-person meetings because sometimes people's computers, their mic is acting up or when they are in a meeting room and they're using a detached camera, the audio sometimes has a lot of um, interference or it has a lot of echo. It's very echoey and that's really hard for the interpreter to understand what they're saying because then you're doing two jobs. You're trying to understand what they just said and at the same time, you are trying to convene the message in the other language. So it's very challenging when the audio isn't working properly. That is in virtual spaces. When it's an in-person meeting, sometimes there is not a right location for the interpreter. Maybe the presenters are too far away and there is not an appropriate location for the interpreter where they can do the interpretation without disturbing the people around them. So just being mindful of th those logistics that we the interpreter is able to listen to who's uh, having a speaking role, but that they when they are interpreting in an in a in person space that they are not disturbing other people around them, having a, a good location for them. Um, what else? Uh, let me see. Um, so when it, and if there are ever any audio when we're encountering audio issues rather than trying to push through maybe it's just taking a quick break and making sure that we can solve it rather than wanting to just continue to move along because then the people that are relying on the interpretation they're not going to get any of that other than we're having technical issues so sometimes it's worth like don't be afraid to take one minute and troubleshoot it so that we can go back to what we were talking about and not lose people in between the technical issues. Did you have anything else, Jorge, for this one? No, I mean, no, that was great. Um, so I'll, I'll go on to tip number nine. That's all right. Uh, and I think this is very important because, um, I mean, even when you've done it so many, so many times, sometimes you just, you know, you're just thinking about the, the entire presentation and, you know, you, sometimes you, you forget what button to push, right? So I think it's important at the beginning of the meetings to have a slide, uh, like Nicole, she always does this. She has a presentation of an instructions for selecting a language um, and other ways to participate. So just having that, that slide with those instructions so people know if they want to access the interpretation, how to access it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's important to present it as you're giving the, uh, the oral presentation so that people can follow along the slide and then uh, post the, the slides in the chat too so people can, can reference it. Um, and, you know, we were mentioning this before too, but if, you know, if the interpreter's doing the interpretation in an in-person meeting, maybe have somebody else giving out the, giving out the, um, the headsets um, so that the interpreter can be fully focused in the conversation at hand and, you know, can be interpreting as best as possible. Thank you, Jorge. So we're on tip number 10. Uh, we're getting to the end of the tips, but this one is uh, when you are the presenter and you know that what you're presenting is getting interpreted into another language, just remember to speak slowly. I'm guilty of the opposite, uh, of not speaking slowly enough. Um, but if you have somebody that you know that can give you a cue, like hey, you're, you're going too fast, maybe do that. Because I know that when we're talking and we are talking to a, maybe a bigger audience, we can get a little nervous and we can speak a little faster, or maybe that's just how we speak. But just being mindful that we need to slow down a little bit so that the interpreter can fully capture what you're saying. But also this is for a simultaneous interpretation. So what we're doing right now, but when it's consecutive interpretation, I think this happens more often at clinics where maybe the patient is seeing a doctor and then there is someone that is doing the interpretation by segments. Just remember to pause. Uh, sometimes whoever it is maybe providing direction, they go through all of the directions in one shot and the interpreter is not given a chance to go little by little. 
And also just be mindful that creating this uh, segments will allow also the person that is benefiting from the interpretation to ask questions as we are going through the, through the content, rather than wanting to do all the information in one shot, then have the interpreter kind of summarized and then have the person who needed the information in the other language, they don't have enough time or even context to ask questions if they had questions. So just be mindful of that. Um, also, if you are inviting, if this is a simultaneous interpretation and you're inviting participants to use their preferred language to ask questions, give them a cue uh, or you can tell them, like, if you want to ask questions, you can say in English, I have a question. If you want to ask your question in Spanish, just tell us in Spanish, tengo que hacer una, pre tengo una pregunta, and then we can move over from there so that the interpreter also knows that they're going to have to switch channels and they're going to have to do, they're going to have to flip the interpretation channels. So those are useful um, uh, cues, cues, I mean, cues for the interpreters. Anything else, Jorge, on this one? Uh, I think you said perfectly. The only thing that comes to mind is uh, it's not only speaking at a reasonable speed, but speaking loud enough for people to, to understand you. I mean, think about when you go to like a city council meeting, the interpreter is an entirely different box, right? Entirely different box. So the interpreter cannot hear anything that's going on except for what's being spoken into the microphone. But when you are in a meeting room and you're, as an interpreter, you're hovering around trying to listen to what everybody's saying and at the same time speaking very lowly so nobody can, so you don't interrupt the conversation. It, it's hard, right? Um, so that's why it's, uh, uh, it's important for the person who's speaking to speak loudly enough so that the interpreter doesn't have to kind of put their head into the middle of the of the table <laughs> uh, um so i think that's i think that's uh, that that's just one thing that came to mind yeah thank you jorge so let's hand it back to nicole so i just want to say I, it's not you know it's not a critique or anything it's just kind of helpful tips right so that to make to make the meetings better right i mean we we love interpreting um you know we love going to the meetings but participating. It's just kind of helpful tips to make the meetings uh, run a yeah. little better. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's a great experience to also learn more about your organization. So as much as we can do this so that we can better relate, not just the literal interpretation, but as much as we develop those relationships with you, also the essence of your agency, we will be at a better space. Absolutely. Thank you, Beatriz and Jorge and Gisela and Stella behind the scenes there for those great tips. Um, and absolutely they're taken in the spirit of trying to improve all of our interactions together. Um, so we're curious which of these um, you all are already using. And if you have other tips that you'd like to add to this list, Gisela put the, uh, a link to the 10 tips that we heard about today from Jorge and Beatriz and that Gisela and Stella also contributed to in the chat and you can see the poll there. I see that several of you have started answering the poll questions. So we're just, we're just curious how common these are already. So let us know which ones you already use. Can I add something, Nicole, as we are of waiting? Of course, for please, go first? ahead. Um, I was telling, and in the prep session for this meeting, I was telling um, the, the working group, that some I understand that not everybody has had a good experience with interpretation or translation agencies. Like sometimes agencies don't have a good experience with trying to hire a interpreter or translator. So the more that you can build a relationship with local uh, providers, I think you will be more successful. Bigger companies tend to do a very minimum assessment of um, interpretation or translation skills. And that might be when you get a person that might not be the best fit to interpret uh, your work. So the more that you can work with agencies that can fully relate your mission and your vision, the better, um, the better outcome that we will have. So true. And we're going to give you some ideas about how to contact people you've just met on today's session. But it's just like anything else, the more that the more you work together, the more that you can customize and tailor the information um, and, and keep building on the relationship that you have, the better it is for all of these nuances that we're talking about in the tips. 
So let's see, we've got, I think we've got slowing down of the responses here. So let's take a couple more seconds, last chance. Anybody want to weigh in? I just ended the poll, Nicole. Okay. So we're, I think we're looking at the results. All right, great. So it looks like a lot of these are, especially um, the design feature over half, um, designating another bilingual person to help out, great. And checking the microphones, those are in, in some pretty consistent use and then others are more rare, but everything got at least some use. So thanks for doing that. Okay. Um, how about questions for our interpreters and translators here? This is your chance to either ask them something about something they presented or something else you've experienced, get their insights, or maybe you have a tip to share with the group. Feel free, either way, you can raise your hand, you can put something into the chat. And as Beatrice mentioned, you can say, I have a question or tengo una pregunta and we'll translate in either direction. So thank you. Not seeing any questions or hands raised yet. Don't be shy. It's a lot of expertise assembled here. And we've just given you a little bit of all the learning that, that they've accumulated. So, and I can just say how much Nicole and I rely on our team and um, additional help like Beatrice and Jorge, because it just, it does take some time and effort, but is so worthwhile. And so um, if there are particular things that might be um, difficult, just now's a great time to ask. And so I see Miguel, you have a question about anything special to do when you have a, a multiple bilingual audience. So more than just English and Spanish as we have here. Jorge, Beatrice, anything to suggest there? Mm -hmm. I've, yeah, I've worked with uh, some um, in, in audiences with English, Spanish, and either Mixteco or uh, Triqui. So when it's in a virtual space, we are able to provide like the three different channels. It's just getting those slides ready uh, so that people can see it in the three languages. Some languages don't don't translate well. Like they, they don't have much of a written structure. Like I know some of the Triqui, Mixteco, it can be written, but will people understand it? Um, so we have, similar to what Gisela was doing, so we have it in the three languages for a virtual space. I've done that before. It works out. It takes more time, so it's allocating more time towards that. And then on Zoom, you can select the different channels. You can select more than one channel for interpretation. It's just also being mindful of literacy levels from your audience. So if you're bringing into the in, into uh, a meeting people that are less comfortable with technology, is how do we provide the right support for them to do it? Thinking about those things. And then when it's in that in-person meeting, the devices that we have, it has more than one channel. And it's again, having also your group that it's gonna help with that third language, or if, I've, I've never done more than three languages in a meeting. I've only done up to three. Uh, but if you if you have your third group of people that it's gonna help those mixed speakers, those three key speakers, that they're able to put them in the right channel that you also test that all of the channels and the devices are working. So those will be my tips. It requires a lot more coordination, but it's doable. Great, thanks for that. And then we also had a question about one-on-one -on -one interpretation and translation, for example, on a helpline or phone line. Any thoughts there? I think this is a very common, I mean, I've seen this one as an older, um, I mean, I think this has been around a lot longer. Like when you call the bank, when you call like some of this um, private sector, they have an interpreter in the line for you. Um, it works. It doesn't have the, the dynamic that you can see that person. So it might be a little clumsy where there might be some dead silence, but it's it's fine. You can do it that way. It's just 
whoever is reaching out to the interpreter, making sure that you coordinate with the interpreter before getting that person on the line so that you know what are gonna be your cues. Like, okay, I'm gonna talk to this patient, the name of the, or this person, the name of this person is so-and-so. I need to verify this and this information. And so that the interpreter knows on the phone, how, how do they get to the right person? And how do they also convey the message so that they know why this phone call is happening? Okay, so just some, some basics about routing and, and triage for the, the topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then a related question from Onis about um, languages that are based on tone and how difficult that can be on the line. Any ideas about that? Are, are you thinking about, um, Onis, do you wanna say a little more about what that situation is? Or Beatrice, Jorge, do you already have some ideas? I, I really don't. I mean, I've worked uh, with Mixteco and Trique communities, um, but usually I'm not the one doing the interpretation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in Spanish and someone from the Mixteco or Trique community is doing the interpretation um, for me. But no, I language is based on tone. Uh, no, I really don't, don't have experience on that. I don't know, Beatriz, if you... Yeah. yeah, that would be a lot harder on a phone line. Yeah, I'm wondering if the, are, are you, uh, Onis, are you talking about the tone of the conversation? Like if somebody is upset or frustrated on the other side? Um, not necessarily, you know, upset or anything like that, but mostly because um, I know it's based on like, on tone, like we have interpreters in-house for Misteco. Mm -hmm. And it's, they say that sometimes they had to, uh, as I said, Misteco Bajo or Misteco Alto. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I mean, I don't know if it's the same on the phone or in person. I'm not the expert on, in, in, in the subject. I've, I've heard from some trico, tricky uh, interpreters, Mixteco interpreters, that they can understand each other. They will just keep their tone. I don't know how accurate that is in the way that I like to relate it. It's like some parents that they speak Spanish, they always speak Spanish to their kids, but the kids reply in English and they understand each other <laughs> at a very decent level. I don't know if it's the best way, uh, but I'm thinking that it might be along those lines, but I don't I don't know for sure. It will be best to ask like an uh, a indigenous language interpreter. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Anybody else have ideas or suggestions? On that, on that or any other topic. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Um, we have a few minutes to go over some tech tips that some of you were interested in, and we can do more about this if there's interest, but I'll turn it over to Nicole Young to go over that, but keep your questions coming. If we have some more time at the end, we can come back to them as well. Thanks, Nicole. Do you mind bringing the slides back up? And again, these are just, uh, this isn't like a how-to kind of technology tips. As Nicole said, we can schedule a follow-up, coffee chat on that if, if others are interested. But just some of the things we've found helpful to do so that if we're the hosts of a particularly virtual meeting that we can help, again, make uh, the job of the interpreter, the translator, the bilingual support team, that we can make their job easier. Um, so things like, and if any of you worked with Nicole last night before, you know that we love our detailed agendas uh, and slide notes, and we will actually put things in there, <laughs> prompts to ourselves, like start recording in Spanish. <laughs> or if there are presenters and speakers who will be speaking different languages, that we, in the detailed agenda, include those kinds of notes so that the interpreter, and then we share the detailed agenda with all the presenters, the interpreters, our bilingual support team, so that everyone knows uh, what's going to be happening and when. Um, and as Gisela mentioned earlier, like including in that detailed agenda, the bilingual messages to post in the chat so that uh, uh, the timing is known, the, the wording is known, all of that. Um, we occasionally get questions about how we make the recordings available in Spanish, because if any of you have used uh, the Zoom interpretation channels before, you know that uh, you can only use that channel, the channels in the main room like we're doing here. So it doesn't work on breakouts. 
you can only record in um, one language on a channel. And so we use multiple devices. So we're recording in English on one device and then uh, have a second device that's on the Spanish cha channel, basically as a participant uh, and have that one recording as well. So that's how we do it. So you could do that with as many languages as you have uh, interpreters. We, you know, we've also learned a lot about both the um, features and the great things that think platforms like Zoom can do, but we also know there are limitations. And so as facilitators, we've had to get creative about how do we provide a really meaningful, equitable experience for participants, no matter what their language is. So we've done things, um, some of our, and this can work in large or small events, but particularly for large events when we wanted to use breakouts, breakout rooms in Zoom, because the interpretation channel is not available once you get into a breakout room. We've done things like had people who have separate Zoom accounts with the interpretation feature available. So we basically create breakout rooms using separate Zoom meetings, each with its own host and interpreter uh, so that you can have bilingual breakout rooms. So as Beatrice was saying earlier about, uh, you know, having interpreters with multiple languages, doing things like multiple breakout rooms <clears throat> with multiple Zoom links also takes extra time to coordinate, to practice, to make sure everyone, to make sure no one gets lost in space when you're, <laughs> when you're sending people to the, the breakouts to different Zoom meetings. So things like that. All of that takes practice, practice, practice. And then if you want to learn more, Zoom has some great uh, help articles, but again, we can schedule another uh, coffee chat on this uh, specific topic if anybody is interested. And back to you, Nicole. Thanks. So uh, we'll put these in the chat as well, but we just, first of all, I wanna give our thanks and appreciation to Beatrice, Jorge, Stella, and Gisela for presenting and providing the support today. So if you um, want to contact them, here's how, and we, we just love working with them and we know you will too. Um, and we also um, work with Oscar Rios, who couldn't be here today, but um, so you can see his name and contact information on the list as well. And you may have your own uh, resources. We'd love to build a, you know, a strong directory of local um, professional interpreters and translators that all of us can draw upon and, and make more of our meetings, events, trainings, et cetera, bilingual or multilingual as the case may be. We just uh, really, have found this to be um, sometimes not in the moment that everyone attends in different languages, but this idea of having a recording available um, in both languages that people can listen to later just feels like it is improving access uh, for our community. And it's something we're really committed to and hope that others will feel more comfortable doing as well. And we know a lot of you already do this. So um, just keep sharing what you're learning. We'll keep sharing what we're learning and we hope that will lead to, uh, to more consistent use of these kinds of um, opportunities throughout our gatherings in our county. So we also have some other events coming up and if I can get my slide to advance. If I can get my slide to advance, there it is, okay. So um, we have a couple of core events um, that we're doing with DataShare Santa Cruz and we're exploring different core conditions so that the ones that are coming up on Tuesday, September 27th is harnessing local data to create the core conditions for economic security and social mobility. And if you've attended one of these earlier on um, health and wellness or the um, lifelong learning and education, you'll know that we just do some deeper dives into the indicators related to that core condition and you have a chance to work in a smaller group, a breakout group with others who are interested in these topics. But we don't, uh, as Nicole mentioned, the dotted lines on the core um, conditions graphic mean that we really believe all of these core conditions are connected to each other. So if you're not currently working in economic security and social mobility, 
but you know that your work in housing, in thriving families and community connectedness somehow connects to those things, um, please do join and, and help us uh, connect those dots as well in that session. On um, October 3rd, we are hosting a bilingual bystander intervention training, and that's presented by a group that used to be known as Hollaback. You may know them by that name, but they've changed their name to Right to Be. And this will be customized to our community. It's in conjunction with Monarch Services, United Way, Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, and is made possible by a grant from the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women the, from the city of Santa Cruz. And really encourage you to save the date on your calendars, October 3rd in the evening from 5 to 6.30. We will be um, sending out some more information and a registration link, but this is all about empowering all of us to intervene more effectively when we see something going wrong. In this case, um, gender-based violence and comments, but and harassment, but it's, it applies to any kind of um, situation where you just feel like this isn't right, somebody should do something, and maybe that somebody is me. So they offer a lot of different ways that you can safely um, try to um, intervene in a situation. And we attended a virtual version of this last year and found it just really compelling and useful. So we hope you will too. And then um, later in October, um, I'm sorry, in, in December, we will be doing another version of the core conditions um, co-sponsored with Data Share Santa Cruz County. And that one is going to be on thriving families and community connectedness, which are two of the core conditions. And again, um, so many things connect to these. So wh whatever realm you're working in, we encourage you to join one of these um, or more of them because they're a great way to learn more about data share and the results menu, the core conditions and the indicators associated with them and finding ways to make those more useful for your own work. So we hope to see you at one of those events or more of them um, in, the, in the coming months. And then these are our contact information if you wanna share any additional feedback with us, but we're also putting um, a, a form in the chat so we encourage you to click on the link in the chat or scan the QR code to open up a bilingual survey in Google Forms. And we're using that so that we can have some more open-ended responses than, than is usually offered through the Zoom version of polls and feedback polls. So stay tuned for more about those events. Um, we're happy to see you here today. We hope to see you again. And we'll hang out for a few minutes if you have additional questions for us or for our presenters today but thanks for being here and have a great week.